all visit, you know, the different things like that. So definitely uh, uh, a blessing. And um, continue to keep me in prayer as I continue to keep each of you in prayer as well. Let me have a word of prayer before we hop into our presentation for this evening. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you be with us these next few moments. Lord, bless us, enlighten us, and uh, draw us closer to you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen and amen. All right. So the vision of the glorified Christ. Now, we are going to cover uh, the last few verses of uh, Revelation chapter 1. And then what we'll do for next week is we're going to go over a quick overview of what we've learned thus far. Um, just a re quick refresher, and that will uh, segue us into Revelation chapter 2. Again, we're in no rush, 22 chapters to the book of Revelation. Um, we've got time. You're not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. So praise you, Lord. All right. Vision of the glorified Christ, Christ, Revelation 1, verses 12 to 20. Here we go. And it says, then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the son of man clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. Verse 14, his head and hair were like were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters. Verse 16, he had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying unto me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Verse 18, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you have seen and the things which you are, the things which are and the things which will take place after this. Verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands, which you saw, are the seven churches. You know, one thing that I find before I go further is if you <clears throat> if you look in the Bible hard enough, per se, you're going to find the answers to what you're looking for, right? Um, one thing I love about how if you, if you happen to have an Amazing Facts Bible or some other Bibles, it'll give you... Uh, in Bible prophecy, what an angel represents, what a tree represents, what a, um, you know, what the, what the wind represents. You know, it gives all of those different things like that. And so the Bible really explains itself. And it's a, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing that it, that it does because you don't have to um, question what does this mean? What does that mean? Right. If you go through the Bible, you're going to find the answer. God is not trying to leave us clueless as to what's and you saw in verse 20 how it said the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the, are the angels of the seven churches answering the question right there. And the seven lampstands, which you saw, are the seven churches. He's defining exactly some of the stuff that is just said in the previous verses. Key point to all of this. And for those that can't see it on the screen, I'm going to share everything that's on the PowerPoint. For those who see it on the screen, well, you can read along with me. The key point is this. This section describes the first vision of the book of Revelation. Remember, Revelation verses 1 through 8 is the prologue. Revelation verses 9 through 11, that's where you find where John is. It's stated that John is on the Isle of Patmos, right? And he receives the vision for the book of Revelation. But then the very first vision that he actually has is now verses 12 through 20, right? After the hear, after hearing the trumpet-like voice in the previous verse, see these verses are following each other, John encounters the resurrected Christ glorified and triumphant. Because if you remember in verse 11, he heard a sound and we talked about uh, a trump, we talked about trumpets last week and you're gonna see trumpets even more so as you know, the seven trumpets, the seven seals and so many different things you're gonna see as we go further in the book of Revelation. But right after he hears the sound, 
he's now taken into vision and 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 John encounters now that resurrected Christ, that glorified and triumphant Savior. Must have been a phenomenal vision. And he begins to describe the vision as he sees Jesus looking this way and he sees him looking that way. All of what I just read in those previous verses. Now, several things that we're going to cover. One is seven golden lampstands. Uh, the second is like the Son of Man, and to those who can see it on the screen, you see the little arrows where things are pointing. Uh, the next is he had in his right hand seven stars. The right side signifies favor. Out of his mouth proceeded a sharp two-edged sword. We're going to look at that. He placed his right hand on me saying, stop being afraid. We're going to look at that expression. And then the last thing that we're going to cover this evening is I am the first and the last and the living one, and I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forever and ever, and I have the keys of death and Hades. I'm going to um, show you a little bit of historical uh, facts uh, related to some of this, and so you'll get it. You'll get it in a, in a little bit. All right, seven golden lampstands. Now, I hope that everybody's not looking at this as just information. Um, I'm hoping that you're taking it, um, you're studying it further, breaking it down more. Um, it's going to enrich your own personal study and your own personal life. Additionally, it's going to help you to assimilate the book of Revelation more into your mind and into your heart. Uh, my dad used to teach me an expression years and years ago, and he said, to teach is to learn, right? I don't profess to know everything, but the more I teach, certain things, the more I'm learning it myself. And so what you can do, even with these PowerPoints, write down information, get the PowerPoint or whatever, start teaching it to somebody else, you start learning it yourself. To teach is to learn. Seven golden lampstands, right? In Jewish tradition, the image of the lampstand symbolized Israel's obedience to God. Now, if you know anything about the Old Testament sanctuary, right, you know that um, you had the court guard, um, out of courtyard where you had the altar uh, burnt offering you had there where they sacrificed the lambs you had the um you had the uh uh the, the little uh man i can't think of the name but you had the little uh where you would wash your hands you had the water uh mm -hmm. in there and that had mirrors within it or whatnot where the priests would wash their hands and things like that and then you would go into the priest would go into the holy place. And when you walked into the holy place, you had um, you had to your left, you had the seven branch candlestick, right? And then to your right, you had the table of showbread with 12 loaves on it, right? And then right before you went into the most holy place, you had the altar of incense. And then on the other side of the most holy place, you then had uh, the um, Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, and inside you have the Ten Commandments and rod, Aaron's rod that budded, as well as a pot of manna. That's the different things that you would see throughout the uh, sanctuary, from the outer court into the holy place, as well as into the most holy place, right? And so these uh, lampstands were not something that was uncommon or unknown, right? So in Jewish tradition, the image of the lampstand symbolized Israel's obedience to God. Now, I know your mind is going to the Holy Spirit and different things along the lines of that. Don't worry, we're going to come there as well. In the New Testament, this role is transferred to the church. The lampstand emblem defines the essential role of the church as God's witness in the world. That's what we are. We are supposed to be God's witness in the world the world. We, you remember that song uh, we used to sing a long time ago, hide it under a bushel. No, yeah, let your light shine. That's what we are supposed to do. I'm going to let it shine. You know the song. I don't got to sing it. You know the song. But we want to let our light shine um, as Christians throughout the world. Seven golden lamps and continued, right? The church is supposed to bear the light of the gospel to the darkened world. Matthew 5, verses 14 to 16, and Philippians um, 2, verse 15. If the church fails to do this, it loses its reason for existence, Revelation 2, 5. Because you remember, and you see how uh, 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 Jesus says that this would be taken from you, that would be taken from you. If you don't do your job, what is the purpose of the existence of the church? Is our purpose just to bicker and argue about the minor things? You know how they say major and minors? Or do we have a bigger 
purpose and reason for existing as the church. Do we exist only to come to church on Sabbath uh, mornings? Do we exist only to come to prayer meeting on Wednesday evenings? Or do we have a bigger purpose? If the church fails to be the light of the world, if it fails to be the light in, in, in Ypsilanti, if it fails to be the light in the Detroit metro area, it loses its reason for existence, right? The church is represented by the seven lampstands, suggest the fullness and universality of the activity of the Holy Spirit on behalf of God's people. Let me tell you something. The Spirit of God wants to work. He wants to work, right? He wants to. And, and we know when we're talking about the early rain and the latter rain, the latter rain is supposed to be much more fuller than the than the early rain, right? And you remember the early rain of Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit descended and thousands were baptized in a day. God wants to pour out his spirit in these last days. But we have to make sure our minds and our hearts are focused on what it's supposed to be focused on, right? We need to be ready to usher in the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so the church has to be a representation, a light to the world. If the church fails to do this, it loses its purpose for existence. Now, on to the next phrase, like a son of man. If you're familiar with Daniel, you recognize this, uh, um, you recognize this phrase as well. You recognize um, the image in a sense, the vision, or I should say, that John had, right? So this title is taken from Daniel chapter seven, verses 13 to 14. Again, most of what you see in Revelation is coming from different portions of the Bible. Daniel and Revelation go hand in hand. So this title, like the son of man, is taken from Daniel chapter seven, verse 13 and 14, where the ancient of days gave the kingdom and the power and the dominion to one like the son of man. In Mark 13, 26, Jesus applied the passage from Daniel, 17, 13, 7, 13 to himself. Son of man in Revelation 1 is evidently Jesus Christ himself and is almost identical to the description of the divine figure of Daniel 10, 5 to 12. Now, some of us, we may already know, you know, some of these things. We may already know that um, Jesus is represented in Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 20. However, it is important for us to know how to show other people that may not know. So taking a look at these different texts, your Daniel 7, 13 and 14, um, Mark 13, 20 to 26, it's important to know these texts so that you can show other people how it is. For instance, at Seventh-day Adventist, we know, Revel we know, sorry, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, and, and, and Michael shall stand up and, you know, there'll be a time of trouble such as never was before. And we know Michael the archangel to be Jesus Christ, but can you prove it? Can you prove it from the Bible? What Bible text would you go to? What several Bible texts would you go to to prove that Michael is Michael the Archangel is Jesus Christ? Because a lot of the Christian world just ascribes Michael the Archangel as just another angel, a powerful angel, but not as Jesus Christ, right? So as Seventh day Adventist, we need to know what we believe and why we believe it, as well as where it's found. I used to hear Dr. Bird say that uh, years ago, know what you believe why you believe it and where it's found so it is important for us to know these bible texts like the son of man continued the son of man was jesus's favorite title in the gospels jesus lived on this earth like a man and suffered he is to the church is the one who understands human problems and suffering because he himself experienced all of these that's what we have in Jesus Christ. We have a Jesus who has experienced this life, who has been through the ups and the downs, who's seen friends turn on him, who's had people run from him, who he's been in situations, right? He's been tempted with different things. You remember Matthew chapter four, he's, he's been tempted. He's overcome different things, right? So Jesus has been through our experience and he is to the churches, the one who understands all of of our problems. So no matter what you go through, you can understand that Jesus, the son of man, has been there and done that and he's conquered it all for you and me. Now we move on to the expression he had in his right hand, seven stars. Now, the right hand signifies uh, favor. If you notice, and you'll notice this as a matter of fact, when we get to uh, Revelation 4, um, when, when Revelation 4 and 5, when Jesus takes 
uh, seat on the on the throne, he goes to the right side. Um, you remember, you remember when the angel appeared, right? He appeared on the right side of the um, right right side in the temple, right? Right side always signifies favor. You remember Matthew chapter twenty five? Where are the sheep? Where are the goats? Right? The sheep are on the right hand. Those who are not. The sheep are on the left hand side, right? The right hand signifies favor. And so even why is this important? Because even though once we get into Revelation chapter two and three, and you see the churches that um that are having various issues, they're still in his right hand, right? That signifies favor, right? That's good news, right? Because if they were in the left hand, then that means, man, y'all are unfavorable. But as messed up as they were, they're still in his right hand of favor. He had in his right hand seven stars. In Daniel chapter 12, verses 3, God's faithful people are associated with the stars. And Malachi, the priest and messengers of God's people, are referred to as angels. Malachi 2, 7 and 3, 1. The stars are the angels or leaders of the church is Revelation chapter one, verses 20. This signifies, my friends, that Christ has the leaders of the churches in his in his care. Situations seem, may seem very bad in the churches, but understand that Christ is in full control. One of the things that Ellen White says, she says, in the last days, it may seem like the church is about to fall. Do not abandon ship. It will go through. Do not hop out of the Seventh-day Adventist church. Be in Christ, be in the Seventh-day Adventist movement. It may seem like it's going to fall, but it will not. Jesus Christ will carry us through. Out of his mouth proceeded a sharp two-edged sword. Now, here's a question. Why isn't the sword in his hand? Great question. These are, these are questions that I tend to ask myself as I'm reading the Bible. If I'm looking at out of his mouth proceeded a sharp two-edged sword. Why is the sword coming out of the mouth? Where do you typically hold the sword at? In your hand. If you're right-handed, it's going to be in your right hand. If you're left-handed, it's going to be in your left hand. But this sword is coming out of his mouth, not his hand. The two-edged sword in the Old Testament is associated with the execution of judgment upon the wicked. And that's Psalms 149, verses 6, to those who can't see it on the screen. The fact that the two-edged sword comes from Christ's mouth rather than his hand shows that this battle is verbal in nature rather than physical. This ain't no battle where you can fight with your hands, right? It's not that we're fighting a spiritual battle here, Ephesians, mm -hmm. right? You know if you know you know the you know Ephesians, you know the armor of God, right? Put on the armor, the whole armor of God, right? And and you want to have that word of God, you need to know that word of God because that's how you're going to fight the different things spiritually. If you don't know the word, what you're going to fight? What you're going to fight the enemy with? What, what do you fight? You have to know the word of God because this is not. It doesn't matter how many weights you lift. It doesn't matter how much you exercise. It doesn't matter how much you do. You cannot fight the spirit world physically. You've got to do it with the word of God. So the fact that this two-edged sword comes from Christ's mouth rather than from His hand shows that this battle is verbal in nature and not physical. So it's imperative that we know the word of God. Stop being afraid. Now, this is what's known, and I'll read it on the screen, like I say, for those who can't see it. This is known as a present imperative. I, I believe we all know that imperative is, is a command to do something right now, right? So the grammatical construction of the present imperative that stop being afraid, it indicates the stopping of an action already in progress. He, John is told to stop being afraid. All right, so here we go. Prologue, John chapter, I mean, sorry, Revelation chapter uh, one, verses one through eight. You have the prologue. He has this, he's on Patmos, sorry, he's on, on Patmos. He has this vision and then he's told, stop being afraid, right? That is an imperative, that's a present imperative showing that he was already afraid for whatever particular reason he's afraid, but Jesus says to him, stop being afraid, right? And it's a phrase that John and the disciples were familiar with hear hearing. So when he's told stop being afraid, it's not something that John, remember, he's one of the 12 disciples. It's not a phrase that he's unused to hearing. Matthew 14, 27, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer, it is I. 
Do not be afraid. Matthew 28, 10. Jesus, and Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee and there they will see me. Mark chapter 6, verse 50. But they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked to them and said to them, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. John chapter 6, verses 20. But he said to me, to them, it is I. Do not be afraid. Jesus uses an expression that John is already familiar with by saying, stop being afraid. You know what that reminds me of? That kind of reminds me of in, in Daniel chapter two, you remember when, when God gives Nebuchadnezzar the vision, right? He gives him the vision of an image, right? And you know the image with the head of gold and all of the different colors and on the bronze, the silver, you know, the mixtures, you, you know all those from Daniel chapter two, right? And so God gives him a vision of something, right? Even though he couldn't remember the vision, he could recognize images, right? Because they worship, right? Bab the Babylonians, they worship images and statues and things like that. God gives him a vision of something that he's familiar with seeing, an image and a statue. Now, you should scratch your heads a little bit because you remember in the book of Exodus, right? In the Ten Commandments, says, thou shalt not worship any image. Why is God giving him something that the word expressly forbids the people of God to worship? But he's using something on a person who is not a believer in order to spark a in that belief. Somebody should scratch their head right now how God operates because, see, often we put God in, in boxes. We, we neatly pack him in boxes and we misquote certain texts without context. We misquote Sister White without proper context, right? And then we make people or, or make, make God be exactly what we are and how we are and different. And man, God is a big, big God, way bigger than any of us, right? And so he tends to use things that people are familiar with. He uses an expression with John on a prison island that he is already familiar with. Matthew 14, 27, I read it. Matthew 28 and Mark 6, 50, John 6, 20. Stop being afraid. So it's deeper. It's deeper than just the fact that John was, was in fear. It's the fact he uses something that John is familiar with hearing in order to get his attention and say, hey, this is Jesus who's speaking. I've used this expression before. Stop being afraid. Now, the keys of death and Hades, right? I'm going to read this. Let me see if I can move something over on my screen because it's blocking it a little bit. There we go. All right. The keys of death and Hades. The Greek word Hades here refers to the power of death. I need you guys to follow me. I'm going to read you a long excerpt right after this. I need you to follow me on this. In Revelation... While Hades is a place where the dead go, it also refers to the demonic powers of death. Remember, historical context. Now, let me pause right there for a second. Oftentimes when we read the Bible, we read into it our understanding of death, of different things like that. You have to remember historical context. You've got to go back to the Bible and say, what did they believe often about death, right? I, I'll show you a picture one day, or you hear me preach this sermon, but... Um, one of the ways that they saw the world back then was not this circular world, right? They saw the world as kind of like an oval and there were pillars underneath it, right? And underneath those pillars were what, what was called uh, Hades, right? And Sheol, you see Sheol often in the book of, in the book of um, Psalms in different places, right? So underneath these pillars was, was, was Sheol, right? And Hades. And the way that the world, the way that their understanding and their historical context was they thought that the world sat on these pillars, right? And it was more of an oval, not a circle, how the earth is, right? And so what they believed was that the, there was a rakia, and that rakia is the firmament. And so basically, they believed that there were windows that were on top of the rakia, and so these windows would open up, and that's how rain would come through. And why do you think you have text Malachi open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, right? There's a lot of historical context that plays a humongous part in understanding what the Bible authors are. You gotta remember that certain that that Bible authors, they're writing based on their context. Understand that the Spirit of God moved as the people of God wrote these different 
uh, books of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. However, they still had an understanding of the world in that time frame. What do I mean by that? All right. Quick thing before we go further. You remember when Joshua, he's fighting a battle with Joshua and he prays to the Lord and he says, Lord, let the sun stand still. It wasn't till thousands and thousands of years later that we started to understand that the sun doesn't move. It's the earth that rotates. Right. And so technically the sun never did anything. The sun always stands still. It's the it's the it's the earth that does the rotating around on its axis, right? But they're writing from their particular worldview. So the 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 the, the more accurate way that Joshua would have put it, if he would have had our understanding of worldview, is that he would have said, God, I pray that the earth stands still so that it would have stopped rotating on it on its axis, right? Historical context plays a part. There's so much more that I could tell you about that, but I got to move on with Revelation, right? It governs the world of the dead, and as, as is evident in the Greek descriptions of the god Hades, possesses the key as an attribute of his strength. Why does any of this matter? Don't worry, I'm going to show you this in one second. But now Christ has overcome death and Hades, that demonic pair, he has seized from them the key that place where they guarded the dead because again you've got to understand their worldview of how they thought that the dead were guarded in Hades and in Sheol and these different places why do you think the bible uses certain places there because we know when we go when we die we just stay in the grave that's what happens but again you've got to understand their worldview to what they are writing i'm going to read you something Right, historical context, the keys of death and Hades continue. The, the portrayal of the glorified Christ in Revelation chapter 1, 17 and 18, as the first and the last who holds the keys of death and Hades, bears striking resemblance to the description of an Hellen Hellenistic goddess, Akete, who was very popular in Asia Minor at the time of the writing of Revelation. This was one of the goddesses that were worshipped. Akete was ascribed universal sovereignty. Remember, who has universal sovereignty? God. But Hakate was the one who they believed had universal sovereignty in that worldview. She was considered both the, both the source and ruler of heaven, earth, and Hades, and the agent by which it would come to their end. She was called the mistress of the cosmos and the key bearer because she was popularly thought to possess the keys to the gates of heaven and Hades, right? Doesn't this all sound like, doesn't this all just sound like what we saw in Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, right? Ekate, Ekate, that goddess, right? That was the one in that worldview that they felt was the one who guarded, who had, had the keys to death and Hades. That was the one who they thought had the universal sovereignty and universal rule over the heaven and the earth, right? But that sounds exactly like Jesus of what John described in Revelation 1, verses 17 and 18, right? It goes on to say, she could travel back and forth between heaven and earth and report on earth what was going on in heaven and in heaven. And in heaven, what was happening on earth. In addition, she used angels to mediate her messages. She was frequently addressed in this way, beginning and end are you, and you alone rule all. For all things are from you, and in you, you do all things. The eternal one come to their end. Now, Revelation chapter 1, verses 13 and 18, which I read a little bit ago, was intended to evoke a parallel to the popular concept in the minds of the original reader portraying Christ as usurping the authority of Hecate as well as that of every other natural or supernatural authority. Why is this important? Because what Jesus was trying to do through John writing what he just saw is he's trying to destroy every other god and goddess out there that the Greeks, that the Romans, that all of these individuals were worshiping. And so that term the keys to death in Hades, that's not that's not an original biblical term, right? That's a term that was ascribed to Hecate 
who 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 was known to have the keys to death and, and Hades, but because Jesus rose from the grave, right, and Jesus is the risen and glorified Savior, the Bible shows us that Jesus is the only one that has the keys to death and Hades. Jesus is the only one that has all power on heaven and earth. Jesus is the one to be worshipped, not Hakate, not any one of the rest of these. But John had to deal with their worldview. And he had to show how Jesus was the actual fulfillment of the one having the death, the, the key, sorry, to death as well as Hades well over Hakate, right? Oh, this is some good stuff, folks. I don't know about you, but I love historical context because that's what lets me know why something was written, who, was, who it was written to, and what it meant actually in the original context. See, what you got to understand is that when you read a Bible text, right, you don't go automatically to present day application. It's a five step process. And don't worry, I'm going to get into all of this stuff later on down the line. It's a five step process that you go through. Right. First, you've got to figure out, you know, what did the text mean when the biblical author originally wrote it? Right. Who were they writing it to? What was the audience they're writing to? What was the time frame? Time frame matters. If I was to write something in 2021 and somebody was to write something in 1700, 1700 and 2021 are two different centuries that look totally different, right? So you're dealing with different types of things, right? And so you've got to understand historical context, excuse me, and how important it plays when you're trying to understand what the Bible authors were, were who they were originally writing to and what they were originally writing to. We come to the expression, right there for the things that you saw. That's what John is told to do. The word therefore means in light of the foregoing. So what you just saw, you just saw the vision, right? Remember the prologue, Revelation 1, Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. There's the prologue, verses 9 through 11. Then John on the Isle of Patmos for the testimony of uh, testimony and word of God, right? And then Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 to 18. He's then taken off in vision. He heard the trumpet. He's, he's now taken off in vision and he sees the glorified and holy one, Jesus Christ. And Jesus says to him, now what I need you to do is I need to write, I need you to write down everything that you saw, right? And then he begins to write. Then you go into Revelation 2 and Revelation 3 and Revelation 4, right? And you enter into the throne room and you see these amazing things in Revelation 5 and Revelation 6. We're going to get to all that. But he's told right there for things which you saw that therefore means in light of the four points thus the text would read this way in light of the fact that i am the first and the last talking about jesus himself the living one talking about jesus himself the one who conquered death jesus himself and has power over the demonic forces jesus himself, jesus himself that are threatening our lives right the things which you saw right because of what Jesus Christ is and what he does, these things are written for the purpose of telling God's people to stop being afraid. I, Jesus, am in control. I will be with you always, even until the end of the age, right? So John is instructed to write down the things that he sees because it's to give you encouragement. It's to give you hope. It's to give you something to grab a hold to. It's to show you the end. It's to show you what you got to go through, but it's to show you the matchless love of Jesus. And so he says, stop being afraid. And you can imagine the voice of Jesus, this trumpet-like voice, stop being afraid. I am control. I who hold the seven stars in my right hand, I am in control. I've got it. Though things may look bad, though, though it may look like the church is about to fail, though it may look like you're swamped with all types of life problems and personal problems, stop being afraid. I am in control. Jesus says, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. So next week, my friends, we are going to go over a review of Revelation chapter one. We're going to just hit the high point so that you can have it in your memory and you're going to need some of these things as we go further into Revelation chapter two through Revelation chapter 22. Let me have a word of prayer with you. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for that glorified and risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, without the glorified and risen Savior, Lord, we would have no hope in anything. 
So, Lord, as you hold those seven stars within your right hand, Lord, hold each and every one of us in the palm of your hands. Watch over us and protect us and lighten us and draw us closer to you. In Jesus' most precious name I pray, amen and amen.